researchers, including 115 postgraduate students and 33 postdoctoral fellows. And over this period, we've published over 200 peer-reviewed papers, and they're still coming out. So when we're looking at chemical oil dispersants, what we want to do is obviously not reinvent the wheel. So we spend a lot of effort with every program to review what's already known in the literature. And so in chemical oil dispersants, we want to identify the opportunities and needs for future dispersant studies to support its, uh, its use in Canadian waters. I'm going through these slides very quickly because I'm gonna give you a little feel of 50 programs in 15 minutes. So in chemical oil dispersants, we want to identify key factors which influence dispersant effectiveness, understanding surface tension reduction, emulsification. Um, on the left right-hand side of the slide, you can see studies being conducted by Sintef in Norway, where we looked at artificial energy by water flushing as a means to enhance chemical dispersant use in calm seas, rice, and fessant waters, because we know you need mixing energy for chemical dispersant use. Other things that we're looking at, the public is concerned about the formulations of chemicals used in chemical dispersants. So under the MPRI program, we're developing new dispersant formulations, for instance, um, formulations of chemical dispersants derived from fish waste. And then another thing that was identified in the Gulf of Mexico operations where they use chemical oil dispersants was concerns over oil particle interactions um, oil adhering to marine snow and sinking to the bottom to the benthic environment because of the use of chemical oil dispersants. So we conducted both lab and field under experiments to understand what controls oil particle interactions um, with and without the use of chemical oil dispersants. And this work was done by Memorial University in Newfoundland by Uda Paso. Other studies on chemical oil dispersants in terms of effectiveness of chemical oil dispersants is understanding oil droplet size and plume behavior. So we conducted a number of studies um, building models to look at the potential impact of chemical dispersants in breaking the oil into smaller particles and where do these particles go in the environment and understanding mixing energy and plume behavior. Um, some of these studies were conducted at the OMSET facility, which is a U.S. military base in New Jersey, and it involved um, institutions such as New Jersey Institute of Technology and John Hopkins University, as well as other Canadian universities. Next year, we're looking at conducting field trials with chemical oil dispersants. So we're actually asking Environment Climate Change Canada right now for authorization to release oil into the open environment. Um, for an experiment in chemical oil dispersants next year. Um, this is a large scale operation that involves a number of Canadian universities, American universities, Canadian Coast Guard, US Coast Guard, US EPA, NOAA. Um, so it's a large international study that's being coordinated right now. The second technology we're looking at is in situ burning, um, where you're looking at burning oil at sea on the sea surface. In order to burn oil on, at sea, you have to get it thick enough so you can ignite it. Otherwise, your oil spreads in a slick that's so thin that you can't ignite it. And so what we want to understand are what's the opera operational window for use of chemical, uh, use of in situ burning, how effective is it, looking at air quality impact of the smoke emissions, and of course, the marine ecosystem impact of the residues following in situ burning. Now in Canada, we conducted um, some studies on in situ burning years ago off the coast of Newfoundland, and this led to in situ burning used in the Gulf of Mexico oil spill on an operational scale. However, there are more questions to challenging us to look at. So some of the studies that have been conducted in the MPRI program is for instance, looking at the burn effectiveness on oils that are transported by pipelines in Western Canada and also characterizing burn residue and looking at the biodegradation rates of these burn residues that are, are remaining following in situ burning. The other thing, rather than using booms to thicken up an oil uh, slick to burn, is using herding agents. These are chemical products that can actually herd the oil, reduce the area of the oil 
on the surface of the ocean, therefore increasing its thickness so we can ignite the oil. And these are studies being conducted at the OMSET facility that you see here with a slick um, treated with herders. As with the oil dispersion studies, we're looking at conducting field trials next summer on in situ burning. And we're looking at a number of new technologies. Um, one is a burning tongue technique. We use conventional boom rather than a fire resistant boom to, to bring the oil um, thick enough so you can ignite it. Um, the other thing to use is flame refluxers. These are devices to enhance heat transfer so we can um, have faster burning and less production of smoke. And then applying herders from a remotely operated surface vehicle that can also ignite the oil. And all of these are going to be tested next summer. Hopefully we can get permit to release the oil. At the same time, we'll be testing a new generation of monitoring technologies um, to enhance the US um, Coast Guard smart protocol for monitoring oil spill response. And this includes both ROVs and AUV um, devices in the water. The third technique we're looking at um, doing a lot of research on is oil translocation, where we transport oil from one environmental compartment to another where the oil can be more easily recovered or is biodegraded naturally at a higher rate. And here we're looking at things like using surface washing agents and understanding oil particle interactions on shorelines. And so we conducted some test facilities on the west coast of BC in the NIMO to look at artificial beaches and oil transport and oil particle interactions. We have a study with uh, NOAA where we're trying to understand the submergence of buried oil mats in nearshore environments and how to understand how are they formed, how do we detect them, and how do we remove them. Also, as I mentioned, development of surface washing agents. These are chemicals that aid in the the translocation of oil, primarily from um, shoreline um, systems, such as beaches and rocky surfaces, to move the oil into the water column where it could be um, recovered physically or enhanced uh, degradation naturally once it's in the water. And then, of course, developing decision support tools for shoreline oil spill response. And here we're looking at developing databases where we've collected samples across the country. I'm looking at earth or observations, sea temperature, um, response operations, options that can be used, understanding the types of oil and their characteristics, and of course, geographical data sets. And with this um, decision support tool, should a spill occur on shorelines in Canada, help us make decisions on how we would clean up these oiled shorelines. The other thing is to how do we improve what we're already using, which is physical recovery of oil. So one of the things that we do is when spills occur, our main technique in Canada right now is to actually try to physically recover it with booms and then use skimmers to bring the oil on board ship to bring it back to shore. However, by doing so, by bringing the oil back to shore, we also recover with skimmers a lot of water. So can we come up with methodologies to separate oil and water from the water at sea and dispose of the water back to sea so we don't have a loss of all that transit time. So we're developing techniques for separation of oil from the water at sea. And so we've been developing decanting technologies. And on the left-hand side, you can see a system that was being tested with the US Coast Guard in the West Coast recently, and also um, enhanced oxidation processes and membrane bioreactor techniques. OK, you have two minutes. Okay, and also looking at other decanting oily waste disposal methods, um, such as deemulsification agents and porous organic polymers. Um, these are sponges that can separate oil from water and materials. And so this work is done by University of Toronto, CSRO in Australia. I'll just end with this. And then finally, understanding natural attenuation, um, trying to understand how fast is oil degrading in the Canadian environment? And we've been conducting oil spill studies in the Atlantic, Arctic, and Pacific Ocean, both at sea and on shoreline. This work has involved the, the mooring of, 
um, devices to collect samples for DNA analysis, to understand what microbes can do and what's their capacity. We've conducted studies both in Europe and the North Sea, as well as in Australia and in Canada. And then, as I mentioned, there are a number of cross-cutting science activities. Um, Susan will mention the Atlantis model and some of the modeling they're doing in West Coast, as, as well as Russia on the Atlantis model. And the cross-cutting science activities include studies in oil detection, characterization, oil fate and behavior, of course, no matter what technique you use, people are going to ask, well, what are the toxic effects? Looking at risk assessments, and as I mentioned, predictive modeling to bring everything together. So I think I'll end there and take any questions. Thank you very much, Ken, and uh, it's very nice overview. And uh, so we have time for one or two quick, quick questions. Anybody can unmute and directly ask or, or raise your hands. Okay, it seems there are no questions. And um, so we have, we'll have some time to discuss later on and uh, if we're all put in the chat. So our next speaker is Paul Pastu from ECCC. And uh, so he's going to talk about, uh, intro introduce the, the ECCC oil spill trajectory model. Uh, Paul? Yeah, so, okay, let me uh, share my screen. Okay, share, 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 share screen. Okay, uh, entire screen, window, 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 window. Uh, um, sign out, uh, why am I not seeing all my windows? Entire, and I can do entire screen, I guess. Okay, if I do that, if I do that. Uh, can you see my, can you see my, um, my slides? No, not yet. And uh, you need a, can you, there's a, I think there's screen share. Do you see that? Yeah, no, I did that. It might take a, you don't see them now? No, we haven't seen, we don't see anything yet. Because I'm, 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 I think I am sharing my screen. Ooh. And sometimes it takes a little time. Okay. I'm not seeing it either. Okay, all right, so let me try that again, okay. Um, okay, share entire screen, entire screen. Why? Share system audio, entire screen. Okay, I don't, okay, share screen. That's what I'm doing. Choose what to share, uh, window, aha, aha. There we go, share, got it. Okay. You're seeing it start to come up now. Yeah. Is this good? Yeah, okay. You can you can turn on the oh. presenting mode. Yeah. Okay. Am I am I in presenting? Okay. Am I full screen? No, not yet. You need it. Oh. Um okay. So I think maybe Next the time you can you can go on now because I think we can we can see most part, right? You can see just there's a not in the presentation mode. I think you can go ahead now, Paul. Okay, yeah, good. Okay, so um, thank you very much. So my name is, uh, yes, Paul Pestio. And um, um, so I'm with the um, Environmental Emergency Response Section that's um, in operations at the Canadian Centre for Meteorological and Environmental Prediction, which is um, often or used to be called CMC, might be more used to that uh, acronym, uh, from the Meteorological Service of Canada. So I'm gonna show some, uh, some work from, from, from our team uh, in, uh, in developing a, a, an oil spill um, a model uh, entirely developed uh, within the section um, and some more recent work at the end um, from our uh, colleague in the section, uh, Kyo, Kyo, Shing, uh, Kyo Shin uh, Chang. So um, before, we, before we start, um, just the, the connection with, um, with OPP, with the Ocean Protection Plan. So, um, Cosmos is the Canadian oil spill modeling suite. That's what we, we call it. Um, and the idea was, um, this started in fact, um, uh, with the world-class tanker safety system. Uh, and the idea was to enhance, um, ECCC's response capacity by, um, 
leveraging the, the expertise in science and technology, uh, and environmental protection, and the Met Service uh, by leveraging our respective um, uh, expertise. And, um, and the Ocean Protection Plan helped uh, fund further, further work. And indeed, uh, we were able to uh, conduct, uh, um, well, put, put the fit and behavior in, in, in the dispersion model, I'll show that in a bit, but also run a, um, um, a, a what we call a, a two-year parallel phase where we responded to uh, the National Environmental Emergency Center um, oil spill modeling requests as though we were operational. So the idea here was to not only test cosmos, but to also test our responders um, that have a, a many years of experience in, in responding to atmospheric um, um, you know, uh, needs, for example, uh, poll pollution is of all sorts and, and, and um, radionuclides dispersion around the world, actually, and, and forest fires, smoke, but, but this was quite new for, um, for in, a, in an aquatic media. So um, we did that and uh, Cosmos is not yet operational, but, and the work continues as you'll, um, you'll see later. So before we go any further, um, just a, a slide here to show that the different processes that we call oil, uh, fate and behavior of oil. So evaporation, um, emulsification, often the also called weathering, the transport, evection, spreading, dispersion in the water column. Um, uh, yep. We are not seeing your slides advance. So I think oh. you are talking to slide three and we are seeing slide one. Oh, that's really annoying. Um, okay. Um, I don't understand. Is it just because it's taking a long time and I've got little, little bandwidth? No, it's because you shared the screen that's not the presenter mode screen. You shared a different screen. Uh, okay. So how do I... Um, okay. So you know what? I'm going to go back to... Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna a new share, and I'm gonna do the entire entire screen. Does this work? This is really annoying. Um, Je crois que c'est le fichier qu'il faut que tu uh, que tu partages, Paul. Mais c'est ça que j'ai fait. Je pensais que c'était ça que j'avais fait. Um, entire share, entire screen. So. I guess you should fast song. Do you see my do you see my slides now? No, nothing. Yeah. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. You know, we certainly we are not in your presenting mode, but you, you can try to you know go like last. Last time, but you really have to see how to advance your slide. Because I'm I'm in I'm in slideshow mode um, on my end. Mm -hmm. Swap presenter. Okay, swap presenter view and slideshow. What about this? If you is this any better? Screen, yeah, if you share screen, you will see um, several choices. One of them is the uh, full presentation screen. If you choose that, it should be on the screen. So can you see it now? No. No. I think okay. you need to try to share again. So so Okay, I'm gonna again. Okay, I'm gonna try share again. Okay. Um so I did entire screen. Um if I do window, you saw that earlier. Share. Okay. Yeah, we can see our screen. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, is this good? Yeah, can you can you just type your you know kind of come to your slide three? You go now we see your first slide. Can you see? Can you okay. come? Do you see my second one now? No, no, <sighs> no. Because you're not in mode presentation. Ben, how do I put in mode presentation? Ben, en cliquant sur présentation. Je comprends pas. Je Je comprends pas que show display settings. Yeah, we see slide show, show yeah. taskbar, mm -hmm. show taskbar. Écoute, je comprends pas. Mm. 
Uh, you put your cursor on the slide three, see what's going to happen. You put your cursor now on top. Let's see, you, you put on cursor on task slide number three on the left. So I'm on slide three right now. It's called oil fate and behavior. Uh, okay, this is. Paul, just là, je vois c'est coché use presenter view. I don't know if it's uh, on the monitor. Pardon? On, uh, dans le menu en haut, là, il y, y, y a un petit coche Use Presenter View. Et si tu l'enlèves, ça donne quoi, ça? Use, pre... OK, moi, je vois pas ça. Uh, à droite, je vois M. Tu as moni Setup, Monitors. Ben, excuse-moi, mais je pas ça. OK. <rire> dans, la, dans la bande, sous la, sous le menu, sous la bande rouge, tu as une autre bande grise. Sur la droite, mais est -ce que une coche. Mais je n'ai pas, pas ce que tu me dis. Uh, show task bar. Uh, écoute, je suis un petit peu perdu là. Moi, j'ai uh, bien et Zoom is sharing a window. Stop sharing. OK. Je ne comprends pas. <rire> écoute, je n'ai jamais eu ce problème là avant. Oh my God, c'est bien. Je comprends. Je ne sais pas quoi faire. Mais, mais, uh, mais, 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 hide presenter view. J'ai hide presenter view, screen, white screen. Ah, oh, quoi que là? Je... Oh, tu as-tu deux écrans? Non, j'ai seulement un écran. Ah, ah ok. Ok, ben j'ai mon, mon laptop. C'est peut-être ça. Ah. Ah, si tu fermes mon laptop, est-ce que vous voyez quelque chose là? Non, c'est noir. Mais là, je... Écoutez, là, je ne sais pas quoi vous dire là. Hmm. là je n'ai jamais eu ce problème là avant. Um... Ok. Um, end, end slideshow. Um, je retourne à Zoom. Um, Est-ce vo est que vous me voyez là? On te là, voit je toi, pas, pas l'implémentation. OK. Share screen. Window. Share. Je partage, je partage ma présentation. Yeah, we see you see now. It's just not in a presenter mode. And, uh... you, you don't see you don't see my like and and, and my window is even yellow, contoured yellow, as though I'm I'm no, sharing it. So... We see our first slide. Uh, um... C'est oh. pas en mode présentation, c'est en mode slide. Yeah, now we see a second slide. Okay, no. Yeah, we, yeah, we see second second. slide two now. Yeah. Mais ce n'est pas en mode présentation, mais peut-être que c'est ce que c'est. Est-ce que je suis en mode présentation en ce moment? Yeah. Non, tu es en mode uh, slide. Mais c'est correct parce qu'on voit la deuxième slide à cette heure. Et, OK. Donc, je suis right, que so this comme ça. Do you, do you see my third slide now? No, you, you have a click. You, I, I would say you click on the last slide now, call for now. And so let's see where we can see the conclusion slide. And then we think about it because your time is almost, uh, almost up. Uh -huh. Yeah, you just come to the last slide and then we probably do the window at the end. We can see, you know, people can stay and see what's the, you, can you, can you, you know, you, now you're, you click on the second and now we see your second slide. Can you go to the end? Click on the yeah. Click on the conclusion. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so step. yeah. Okay. Okay. This is this is. Okay. Well, I'm really yeah. sorry, folks. Yeah. I really I'm really sorry that I I this is a mystery. So. Okay. That's really okay. All so right. maybe you talk to our next step first, and then we can see how much time we can go back. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. So. All right. So. Basically, I wanted to show the drift modeling that we're doing um, and how uh, that's what we're going to do okay, um, to, um, to train our responders to, uh, 
um, to 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 aid the NEEC with uh, with drift modeling. So it's not just it's not really oil modeling for the moment. Um, that's something that we're gonna we're gonna work. Uh, Chosheng has also just recently developed uh, um, not just drip but also um, mobile sources of um, of oil, so that the MLDP, the Model Lagrangian de Dispersion des Particules that we use, um, can actually see the model uh, along the route of um, of a mobile source, it being drifting or or under its own speed. So every every um, you know time step of the model, so it gives a really very realistic. Um, uh, dispersion of oil for uh, for a mobile source. Um, we're working with um, with science and technology for uh, for emergencies for their use of Cosmos and 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 an ongoing uh, validation of the fate and behavior schemes that we've that we've um, we've coded in MLDP. Um, and then um, I wanted to, okay we're we're working with uh, we're very encouraged by you know work by Andy Lin, for example, uh, that was presented last Friday on um, on uh, relocatable or um, you know very um, fine uh, near post uh, modeling because uh, that's something that's critical for us because one of the points that I wanted to make here was that the the, the ocean models that we that we use are are just not um, either don't cover the the a lot of the areas where we we've got oil spills close to shore in, in, in estuaries and so forth. Um, and so we need some kind of downscaling. Um, and then um, uh, hydraulic models are coming online at, uh, at CMC that we'd like to make use of. Um, other pollutants like radionuclides in, 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 um, in dispersion in, um, in water is, is one thing we're working with. And, and maybe a, a further um, objective is, is, uh, is oil and ice. Okay. Um, there you yeah. go. Now, I'll just okay. do you yeah. see? Do you see this? Do you see this slide here? Yeah, after uh, Paul, I think I'll ask just a bit. We say your, you know, your finish. Uh, we we move on for the next speaker, and then at the end okay. you come back to the end issue. We still we miss so many slides. Okay, and okay. Uh, so I think we're we don't have questions for now, and let's uh, you stop sharing, okay. and so Great. we move to the next speaker, and uh, Risha right. uh, Lavin yeah. there, yeah. and uh, I think she's sorry about that. Yeah. No, it's uh, the technology. <laughs> yeah. So our next speaker is uh, Risha Lavinier, and so she talked about long-term multiple species consequences of oil spill inside the sea. Okay, but Paul needs to stop sharing first. I can't share until he stops sharing. Paul, can you stop sharing? Hello, Paul. So okay, I think I was able to override. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Rachel Lovendere. I'm a postdoc researcher working at the University of British Columbia in Susan Allen's research group. Um, I work collaboratively with a team from the University of Victoria and CSIRO. And we work on the impact of oil spills in the Salish Sea. Um, that's on the West Coast. So this is a snapshot of the Salish Sea showing heavy ship traffic on one evening in April. Um, and with this heavy ship traffic, which has been increasing in past years, comes the risk of large scale oil spills. So um, many of the studies on the impacts of oil spills on biology, especially focus on direct or short term effects of contaminants, but there are several knock on effects that could potentially have long term impacts and such impacts are not able to be studied um, on the normal lab or field conditions and haven't really been explored in models. So we are using um, the Salish Sea Atlantis model to try and tackle this problem of long-term impacts of contaminants. The model helps to extend knowledge gained from lab and field studies and projects forward from an oil spill scenario to model um, multi-species impacts of the contaminants on a longer scale. Atlantis uh, is, it represents the inland sea area of the Salish Sea using 130 irregular polygons. And this includes, or boxes, I'll sometimes say boxes. This includes two boxes that represent the boundary and 40 representing land, and they're not included in model calculations. Each box has up to seven depth layers, and the number of layers depend on the total depth of the box, where shallower boxes have fewer layers. Um, our boxes were defined to capture major uh, biogeographical features, 
and the southern polygons were designed to be able to overlap with the Atlantis model for the Puget Sound, which is operated by NOAA. Note that these polygons are too coarse for Atlantis to be used for active incident response, but the spill scenarios explored are appropriate for determining the scale of planned responses. So oil spill scenarios analyzed can be used to undertake strategic planning ahead of a spill and to understand the potential knock-on effects that the spill of a spill should want to occur. Hydrodynamics inside Atlantis, uh, and that's mostly temperature, salinity, and current exchange are forced from time series outputs of Salish sea casts, which is a 3D hydrodynamic model uh, that you'll hear about from Susan. And we're using um, a time period of 2007 to 2021. There are 58 biological groups in the Salish Sea Atlantis model, and this includes nine types of salmon due to the large amount of data and the importance of salmon in, in the region, as well as 12 other fish and other groups that are listed here. And they range from primary producers, such as the phytoplankton, all the way to large mammals, including whales and um, sharks. Species are aggregated based on similar size, diet, and habitat preferences, as well as migratory patterns, metabolic rates, and life history stages. And the model structure was developed based on advice from experts in the region, as well as observational time series and other ecosystem models, which include Osmos and Ecopath with Ecosim, as well as the Puget Sound Atlantis model. The complex species interaction, um, there is complex species interaction between all the biological groups in Atlantis, and this is what actually makes the model uh, very powerful. This diagram shows the functional groups from the lowest trophic level at one to the highest trophic level at five and their various interactions. And these interactions are, as I said, a staple of the Atlantis model and is the key feature for being able to model the multi-species uh, interactions and impacts of contaminants on individuals as well as on the population level. The contaminants themselves um, are represented by four polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons um, that are built directly into Atlantis. And these the ratio of these chemicals are, the differences in the ratios of these chemicals are used to represent different oil types when we're doing uh, oil spill scenario modeling. So for example, diluted bitumen will have a different uh, ratio of these chemicals um, versus something like bunker C. Most important within Atlantis is the movement of oil through the ecosystem. And this is captured first as uptake from the environment, as well as through predation. And this uptake is dependent on body size, life history, uh, consumption rates, prey choice, and other physical and chemical factors. And then contaminants are lost through processes such as metabolism, mortality, excretion, and so on. And then there are the direct impacts on the organism, which can be either lethal or sublethal. And data on contaminant impacts were collected from, as you can imagine, a number of lab and field studies with a focus on looking for data that overlaps the specific representative chemicals that we have in Atlantis. The spill scenarios were developed in collaboration with a number of parties, including Transport Canada and Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, and I've highlighted two of the scenarios that are shown here in this uh, graphic with the location of the spill highlighted by the yellow star. And I was very interested in hearing Paul's presentation and hopefully I can talk to him in the future about um, oil spill trajectory modeling. For us, the distribution of oil in the scenarios is modeled using ocean parcels, uh, which is a Lagrangian tracking model that allows us to inject oil as parcels and determine exactly where the parcels would go uh, when released at a particular location and time period using time steps that are shorter than the Atlantis time steps and a spatial scale that is also shorter or smaller than the Atlantis polygons. The physical forcing that is used in ocean parcels is the same as that that we use in Atlantis. And then we convert the distribution to create Atlantis forcing files um, so that we can fully map the distribution of the oil in Atlantis. The modeling of the scenarios are uh, actively in progress and are not complete in time to show the results here today, 
but I wanted to show you the kinds of results that we can expect from Atlantis. Um, and for that, I will use uh, the Atlantis model for the Gulf of Mexico as an example. The implementation of the contaminants in the Gulf of Mexico model was a bit different from the direct input of contaminants into the Salisy Atlantis model that we're doing, but the results from the model are similar. And so you get a feel for what our results will look like when they're available. So this includes changes in biomass for the different functional groups over time relative to a no contamination baseline. This figure is from a paper by Ainsworth and his team that shows average biomass change of oil simulations for functional groups. The line at one <clears throat> is the no oil baseline and the average varies slightly, that shaded area, due to the sensitivity of a parameter that was being tested in this paper. The groups themselves that you're seeing on the slide here will be different from those in the CLC, but the ability to see their biomass change relative to the baseline projected into the future, in this case in 2060, is a feature of the Atlantis model and is something that the CLC Atlantis model will also be able to do. Similarly, we can examine the age composition of particular functional groups in the population over time, as well as at a specific time period as shown here in this graph. So this graph shows one species with 10 different age classes and the relative proportions at the top and the actual biomass at the bottom, comparing the oil versus no oil scenario at a six month timestamp after the simulated spill. Um, and this is especially, this kind of view is especially important for determining the impact on juveniles versus adults. And in the Salish Sea Atlantis model, there are 33 functional groups that are age structured that we would be able to examine in this way. We can also use Atlantis to examine changes in catch of particular functional groups with time. Um, and this figure shows the percent catch of particular groups relative to a no oil baseline. And you can see that there is a decrease in catch closer to the time of the spill, but with a projected recovery from many of the species, though some still remain below baseline for decades. Um, implementing catch is something that is an uh, add-on onto Atlantis and is something that we can investigate further and interrogate. And with so many different functional groups, there is a wealth of data that can be interrogated using Atlantis. And we're very much looking forward to um, being able to run the scenarios, share the data and have discussions with relative stakeholders. So this is a flavor of the type of uh, data that we will be getting. And I'm very excited <clears throat> for the project um, and the data that we'll be able to generate using Atlantis. And with that, uh, I'll thank especially our funders, as uh, Ken mentioned that this is funded by MPRI, it's one of the projects on the MPRI, as well as the organizations that have developed the model themselves. And my contact information is there in case you wish to talk to me outside of this forum. Thank you. Okay, it's great. We actually guess give you some time. So, okay, some questions. And um, so I see, uh, Rachel, you'll you raise your hand. Uh, hi, Rachel, thanks, that was great. Um, I have a question that for, about something that was sort of an intermediate step for you, but when you use the ocean parcels to simulate oil trajectories, um, mm -hmm. it sounded like that was with the Salish Seacast output. What did you do to make um, the particles act like oil? like? floating or winded or did they mix everywhere water depth wise? Right. Yeah. So for the for the uh, specific scenarios, we release the particles at the surface. We are using um, wind to force the particles because they are at the surface. We don't have them um, decaying or going vertically in the water column at the moment. So that's especially for the diluted bitumen oil spill. We that's basically how we tried to mimic oil in ocean parcels. Um, or it is possible that for some of the heavier oils, we would be able to include vertical mixing in ocean parcels, but we just haven't done that. We've decided to just keep it simple and leave the um, movement on the surface and then have any other mixing happen directly in Atlantis. And do you have any horizontal um, mixing? Yes, add for sure. Random walks people add uh, sometimes. Yeah, so the um, 
the modeling in ocean parcels includes uh, winds from HRDPS. And so there is horizontal movement of winds. Is that what you meant? Uh, no, some people add like a random walk for lateral dispersion of particles. Um, we're just starting to think about doing some similar stuff on the East Coast. So I've like just gotten ocean partials going and right. thinking about how to make it act like oil. So, yeah. No, yeah. So we, okay. did not, uh, we didn't put in any kind of uh, okay. random walk or any other movement, right? So okay, the thanks. particles only move because of the wind and the currents. Yeah, great. Okay, you have a question? Yeah, Rasha, really impressed by all the work that you're all doing out there on the Salar Sea models with Atlantis. Thanks. My question is, in the, in the Gulf of Mexico work, mm -hmm. where you're describing the potential impacts on fisheries, is that actually validated by any of the stock assessment surveys? Because, you know, there's some evidence that, hey, the stocks are actually higher now following the spill because the moratorium on fishing at right. the time in the Gulf of Mexico, so there's actually more fish after the spill than before the spill. So I'm just wondering, you know, these models show one thing, but are they being validated and how do we validate them? Yeah, that's a great point, Ken. So the, the time that this paper came out, and I believe that this was published in, let me go back and actually see there. So I think this is 2017, um, yes. 2018, right? So they had modeled the deep water horizon oil spill, which is a specific spill that you can actually, you know, look at the data. So at least in that case, they were able to, to see the data and compare. They didn't do that comparison in this particular paper. Um, and I think in the paper, they did acknowledge that they did not include the fact that there would be a recovery because of fishing closures. But that is right. something that Atlantis can, um, that we can put in, in terms of um, changing catch. And so that can be simulated in Atlantis. It wasn't done in Gulf of Mexico and we can potentially think about doing it in the Salish Sea. Um, even though right now it's not included in our scenarios. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Point. Thank you. Great work. Okay. Thank, and you. thank you, Richard. I think uh, it's time to move on. And uh, so uh, next speaker is uh, Zhao Yang Yang. I think he's from uh, Concordia. And um, so he's uh, introducing the poster. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes. Go ahead. And you can share our screen. Sure. Right. Yeah, go ahead, Zhao Yang. Okay, uh, hello everyone. I'm Yang Zhao Yang, a PhD student from Concordia University, my supervisor, uh, Dr. Chen and Dr. Li. The very presentation's topic is uh, development and the testing uh, of short oil spill trajectory modeling tool. First, I will give some basic information about oil spills. Then I will introduce our model basic structure and the new calibration method for spill trajectory prediction. Also to Study cases will be presented in the third part. Results and the uh, discussion and conclusion will be given in the last two sections. The oil spill uh, has become a major environmental concern for so many years. The left picture came from a recent Mauritius oil spill, released uh, 1,000 tons of heavy oil into the uh, coastal lagoon, which caused uh, one of the worst ecological disaster in the Western uh, Indian Ocean. And typically, uh, oil spill have uh, two potential consequences. For ecological impacts, uh, toxic substance from spilled oil can cause short-term and long-term damage to marine life and their habitats. For uh, economic impacts, spill cleanup and uh, compensation for stakeholders can be uh, costly. Uh, to help decision makers to have a better strategy for oil spill response, we develop a model to predict the trajectory and the phase of uh, offshore oil, oil spills. The model inputs include the current wind and temperature oil properties and spill information. The model um, consists of uh, two major components. Uh -huh. The transport module is a Lagrangian particle tracking model to simulate the spill trajectory. The weathering module is uh, to predict the uh, change in oil mass and the properties over time based on a series of uh, weathering algorithms, such as uh, spreading, evaporation, entrainment, and uh, hemispecification. Uh, all the ordinary differential equations involved in this model are solved by the fourth order uh, rangic uh, Kata method. In the Lagrangian transport model, uh, the Trajectory simulation is sensitive to the current and the 
wind shift uh, coefficients. They are typically default as one and 0 0.03, but uh, they also change with other environmental factors. So it's necessary to calibrate uh, the Lagrangian model to get the uh, optimal coefficients to uh, for certain with accidents with uh, observations. Uh, trajectory, uh, the uh, tradi traditionally, uh, the Lagrangian model is uh, calibrated by minimizing the difference between simulated trajectories and the actual path of uh, buoy drifters. However, uh, the drifter data are and uh, uh, really insufficient for our southern loose wheels. So we propose a new method to calibrate the, the boundary model based on satellite images. This figure shows the procedure of our calibration method. We apply uh, FishNet2 and the uh, Intersector2 in ArcGIS to extract uh, sampling points of uh, oil slick from satellite images. So after uh, decreasing the observed surface oil, we can get uh, the x y coordinates of uh, this sampling points to represent the geolocation of oil slicks more accurately. On the other hand, we formulate a series of uh, modeling scenarios with a different combination between current drift coefficient and the wind drift coefficient. We select the, the commonly used range for these parameters. And next step, we calculate the KR divergence of a particle spatial distribution for each scenario. Uh, KR divergence is an indicator to quantitatively measure the difference between two probability distributions. When this, zero, uh, this value is zero, it means two distributions are identical. Otherwise, the score is uh, positive. And in this study, uh, P is the probability mass function of the sampling point uh, spatial distribution, and the Q is for predicted trajectory. Um, after modeling uh, all, of the scenario, all of the scenarios, we can get the coefficient combination with the minimal KR divergence, uh, then use this uh, uh, optimal uh, parameters for scale trajectory prediction. In this study, we have uh, two cases here. Uh, case one is a hypothetical use field in the coastal water uh, of Vancouver. Uh, we chose this area because uh, Vancouver has uh, intensive shipping activities in Canada. Uh, this study case is uh, designed to validate uh, our model by comparing it, uh, the oil spill model known developed by no, uh, NOVA. Uh, the model configuration of case one is summarized in this table. Uh, different diffusion schemes are used to make sure the comparison is uh, um, comprehensive. Case two is a real oil spill in 2018. The Sanchi oil spill occurred in uh, East, China, East China Sea. Uh, this study case is uh, designed to test uh, the applicability and the uh, validity of uh, our calibration method. The uh, left picture is the timeline of the accident. The red figure is the digitalized oil slick from the satellite image. Different colors represent the oil slick at uh, different times. We use the uh, first straight data to make, make calibrations. The last two are used for uh, validation. Here is the result of uh, spill trajectory simulation from case one. Uh, the red trajectory is from our model. Uh, the blue one is from GNOME. Uh, as you can see, two trajectories basically overlapped under uh, different diffusion schemes, which proves the validity of a spill trajectory simulation from our model. Uh, here is the calibration result for essential oil spills. The horizontal axis uh, represents the wind coefficient and the current coefficient. The vertical axis is the sum of uh, KR divergence for oil slick. Uh, the uh, latitudinal distributions and the longitudinal distributions. We select the parameter uh, combination with the minimal sum of uh, KR divergence, uh, which are 0 0.8 for current coefficient and 0 0.05 for uh, wind coefficient as an input to predict the, the trajectory of essential oil spills. This figure shows the comparison 
uh, of trajectory simulation between the two models and uh, satellite observations. The red trajectory is uh, our model, uh, which is uh, calibrated by the newly proposed uh, method. Uh, the blue trajectory uh, is from NOM, which is uh, uncalibrated. The black points are observed always flakes from satellite images. Uh, so you can say, except uh, during the initial period, obviously, uh, the calibrated results uh, have a better performance on the uh, prediction. Uh, this indicates that uh, our care, uh, care um, diver uh, divergence based on calibration method can improve the spill trajectory prediction. So uh, this study develops a two-dimensional OSD model under different diffusion, uh, diffusion schemes. The model validity is uh, proved by the results of uh, comparison with the norm. Uh, we also test uh, the newly proposed uh, uh, calibration method in the essential OSD field. Uh, results show this approach can include the performance of uh, OSD field trajectory prediction. So that's it. Thanks for listening. And yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Diane. And uh, so he, you're going to have a poster tomorrow, right? So people can come to your poster to dis discuss with you. Is, is that right? Uh, okay. Uh, what? I'm not. Sure. No, I think uh, tomorrow's your you 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 do you have a poster or not? I mean, all day long. No, tomorrow. I think tomorrow sometime tomorrow, right? Yeah. Oh, because I'm not sure of the schedule. Okay, I'll check. I'll send you by email. Okay. Oh, thank you so uh, much. Yeah, do you have any, anybody have any quick question for Zhao Yang? Okay, so if not, we are almost back on schedule. And so our next speaker is um, Rick Danielson from DFO talking about radar set and uh, our, our world of golf stars. So Rick? Great, there we go, okay. Uh, to actually get this in uh, full screen mode then with you. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, uh, thank you. So um, <clears throat> shifting gears a little bit, not very much uh, from, from our last talk, but uh, towards um, the North Atlantic right whale uh, where, where only a few hundred are alive today still, their fate depends on the ability to uh, locate and feed on zooplankton in high concentration. So um, the Canadian radar sa satellites have the ability to detect ocean filaments that are a zooplankton concentrating mechanism, uh, but wind speed is a confounding factor. So uh, in weak winds, for example, filament structure is easy to detect and vice, vice versa. In strong winds, it's harder to detect, and we'd like to be able to detect this sort of uniformly over the the uh, lifetime of the satellites and and over the uh, years that we've been able to monitor the southern Gulf of Saint Lawrence, where the right whales have started to move into and feed. Um, <clears throat> I should add that uh, the North Atlantic right whale may be our best indication of of high colonist concentrations. In fact. Um, and uh, the caveat here is that we lack sightings where we are absent and we lack sightings where we have difficulty making them. Um, so that's a caveat to this little diagram on the Gulf of St. Lawrence coverage, which is, which is just for the last two weeks. So I'll just go over coverage over the last few years, uh, get into the coherent filaments that we're trying to identify with synthetic aperture radar and their correlation with the wind. So um, on behalf of Will, Jing, Hui, and I, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, uh, Jing's altimeter talk yesterday was on monitoring the gas bay current. And uh, that linear, that flow when linear periodically breaks into coherent eddies. And we've, we've known that since the beginning of, of satellite uh, observations, uh, even before that, of course, uh, but uh, these these uh, departures of the gas bay current from the coast uh, dictate uh, flow downstream, transport into the southern gulf, where the whales tend to be feeding now. Um, it varies according to the path of the, of the current, and, 
and and whether or not it moves towards the south as as Brennan et al have, have been uh, showing in in 2008 as opposed to in 2012 where it where the gas bay current flow was directed more towards the North Atlantic out through the Cabot Strait. Um, in uh, acoustically, we can we have acoustic measurements of uh, that that identify aggregations of krill, which is a somewhat larger uh, uh, animal in in the water column, and um, uh, the, the, there is converged the MAPES that I'll have, have shown that that there's a a co-location of of convergence at the surface of ocean current convergence at the surface and these aggregations. Um, and that's the sort of uh, features that we can see from SAR. But um, as uh, Sorochan ha have, have clearly shown, it is uh, not just the, the full life cycle of, of the zooplankton, but the, the, the convergence and di divergent patterns through the water column that we're interested in. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to focus in this talk on what's going on at the surface. This is the sort of scene we can see. Uh, we're looking at what's, I'll define SAR contrast in a sec, but um, invariably when we look uh, at the surface with a synthetic aperture radar, we uh, have generally found it to be easier to see uh, structure of the kind that we're looking for when the, the winds are light. And that seems to be more, more favorable as Monk et al have shown. Um, around the world, everywhere, this is this is a general uh, result. So um, we also have a, um, a theory to uh, describe the structure that we see from a synthetic aperture radar that that would suggest uh, a wind speed dependence. But in this case, um, if we uh, we're looking at the second line here of what uh, is a description of the surface roughness effectively as a function of various uh, of certain variables, one of them being the, the ocean surface convergence on the far right in the middle equation. And uh, another factor being the uh, friction velocity or a, a proxy of the ocean uh, surface wind speed. And that's the, that's the term we want to, that's the confounding factor that we'd, want, we'd like to uh, normalize out, uh, uh, or reduce the dependence on. So um, what we propose is to adjust the, the Q, Q ratio or the sigma naught ratio. These are roughly equivalent. Um, this ratio by some functional dependence on wind speed. That seems to be the easiest approach. Maybe not the best. We could, we could simply use this equation as well. But um, we're developing an in-house uh, uh, surface con uh, coher coherent structure or, or filament structure uh, calculation. And I'll mention that in a second. And, and what we'd like to do is reduce the dependence in these circular areas of uh, what is effectively weak wind and what is also uh, a rather strong pattern of, of uh, SAR contrast. So the filaments aren't that interesting here, and they are more interesting where the whales actually happen to be in this scene. But um, if we define a simple uh, correction factor for the SAR contrast, uh, the sigma naught ratio, um, and pre-multiply that by some, some uh, uh, simple factor like this, like the one on, on the left, um, uh, the question is, what would the exponent be? This is going to be a nonlinear uh, correction, but um, how, how can we identify uh, the extent of nonlinearity that we'd like to, to, uh, to use? And specifically, the one that, that would be best, ap most appropriate for our, uh, for our data, the, the radar set contrast and, and say the, the ERA uh, wind speed uh, or, or some estimate of wind speed. Uh, so the coverage uh, was, uh, we have almost a thousand scenes from 2008 to 2020 um, within the North, within the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, the, uh, we have uh, hourly co-locations of, of, the, of the wind and at the, the 10 meter wind speed. And um, 
in the past five years or five, six, seven years, uh, we have um, sightings of, of North Atlantic, right? Whales, the, so the region of interest is the Shediac Valley. But, um, and we have three domains here. I'll get to those in a sec. But, but here, I just wanna point out that the, the best sighting coverage was during 2019. And that was best sightings and SAR coverage, by the way. So most of the uh, data that we have is, is from those, uh, from that, that time. Um, the three domains of interest uh, where, the, where the right whales tend to be sighted are the uh, Anticosti, just northwest of the Anticosti, uh, of Anticosti Island. Um, we'll take a, our domain in Ga around Gaspé, um, north of Gaspé Peninsula, and we'll take this primary region of interest where the right whales tend to feed. Um, so, and we'll take the, we'll average the SAR contrast values in these, in these uh, black lined areas. And then the, the red line areas is where the, uh, is, is a grid point value of, of the wind speed. And we'll develop a, a method of, of this. So this is very similar to general, generalized methods of, of calculating uh, current con or proxies of ocean current convergence, which would be proxies of, of, uh, of uh, surfactant uh, accumulation as well. So they are interesting for a number of reasons, not just the, uh, the vertical circulations that may be associated with them. Um, but we, we will take on the diagonal a smoothed or in, incre increasingly smoothed estimate of, this, of, the, of the sigma naught value of interest and um, this, the SAR backscatter. Um, and then from that, we can calculate a contrast value, which is a, a ratio of the smooth to high resolution minus the smooth version divided by the, the, the uh, smoothed version. That's our contrast. So there are various estimates we can make of, of contrast, which is above the diagonal, but the ones that the, the value, the uh, resolutions that seem most interesting are the ones in, in the outlined in blue here, because they capture not, uh, not too little and not too much of the, the pattern of the patterns. Um, and I think that's generally true of almost every scene. This, this, this bracket of, of resolutions is good. So um, that's, um, we, can, we can take that uh, bracket, those three estimates of SAR contrast, and we can average them effectively, uh, or take the agreement in them and uh, I identify filamentary features that are large in scale. The, uh, the three of them therefore allow us to define what, uh, uh, try, isolate the patterns of interest, isolate the filamentary patterns because there are three estimates, they all have to agree. And then the middle panel here shows that uh, there are some filamentary patterns that are coherent, at least uh, have a, um, have a, uh, a dimension that's greater than 10 kilometers. And um, so th those are the patterns that we'll focus in on. Um, and just to jump the gun, this is the unweighted pattern, and the weighted pattern here is, so if I go back and forth, you can see what we're going to be doing is uh, highlighting or at least preserving the areas that are uh, of interest where the right whales are, and um, reducing the pattern uh, amplitude where the winds are, are lighter. To do that, to identify what was this exponent of 0 0.8, um, we'll use both Pearson and distance correlation. Now, distance correlation is specifically designed to as a measure of nonlinearity or non-monotonic dependence. And so it's an interesting new uh, metric of, of correlation. Um, Pearson is the one that we all tend to use. And again, to jump the gun, there's not much of a difference in finding this uh, value of 0 0.8 from either of them, but um, uh, it is uh, notable, I think, that, uh, that, that a nonlinear, non-monotonic dependence can be calculated. Um, both are, uh, so uh, let me um, 
summarize for the 324 scenes, uh, we can, um, these are just summer scenes. So these are just the scenes when the winds are light and the patterns should be good and the whales are present. And we have uh, on the top two panels, the hourly values and on the lower two panels, the, the seasonal values. And I, I draw your attention to the seasonal uh, relationship, uh, particularly for the Shediac domain, which is in red, um, where we tend to see uh, reduced SAR contrast, it's uh, at the same time, we tend to see higher winds. So that, that's true um, season by season and, and between the two, between the three domains. Um, okay, it's just a little, one left. Okay, okay. So uh, come to the, coming to the end, we, we can identify the peaks in the Pearson and distance correlation um, where the blue and the black dots are, are high. This is where we can, I'm not showing that here, but this is where the distributions of, uh, of the values are relatively uh, bivariate Gaussian, which is just where we, where we would expect to see Pearson get a little bit higher than, than distance correlation. Um, so uh, basically it's a very simple experiment, but it, it tends to work. We can, we can apply it to our back, to our, SAR contrast values, the ratio of sigma knots, uh, do the correction and get a much reduced value uh, as a function of wind speed of this of the uh, SAR contrast. So that that's basically the the upshot of the experiment. It uh, it's a reasonable um, metric to use either in this case distance or Be or Pearson correlation. Um, both are are similar. And uh, in case you missed it, there seems to be some, uh, uh, the exponent that we find is the best is the one that fits between the linear and nonlinear components. And I, I haven't gone into why that is, but it seems to be uh, a reasonable interpretation of, of, our, uh, of, this, of this value of 0 0.8, which is a simple weight and it seems to work. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Rick. And uh, I think let's uh, move on. And uh, uh, because I don't see any hands or any, any chat, people can leave a question in the chat. So next, next speaker is Susan Allen from UBC, and she will talk about the oil spill in the South Sea. Susan. Hello, everyone. I hope you can see my screen. And yes. I hope you don't see all the participants. Okay. Um, so I am very pleased today to present the results of our project that was funded by Neopar, um, looking at oil spills in Salish Sea. This is a collaboration with my group and Hibo News Group with their oil spill um, modeling expertise from Dalhousie University and Stephanie Chang's group also at University of British Columbia. The core of the work was done by Rachel Mueller here, who is the first author but she has now moved on to the University of Washington. So I'm gonna take you back to the Salish Sea. And so here is the Salish Sea again, it's uh, between Vancouver Island and the mainland. And here I'm including um, the Strait of Georgia, the main body, um, uh, also uh, Puget Sound and um, uh, Juan de Fuca um, Strait here. In addition, on top of this plot, I have put the AIS ship traffic data. AIS is a system whereby ships uh, report their position um, and some other information. Um, sometimes that information is good as to their length, et cetera, and sometimes that information is very poor as to their length. Um, we've seen a lot of one meter ships out there. Um, and so we're going to um, uh, use this information um, in this statistical oil spill model. Now, this is not funded by MPRI, and this has a slightly different focus. So this is not so much about there's been an oil spill that happened. Where did that oil go? What is the impact on the environment? How do we clean it up? This, this study is kind of before that before we have an oil spill and we have first responders trying to decide where to put equipment or planning spatially for the potential of an oil spill. Um, and so this is looking at things um, beforehand. And so one of the classic ways to do that is to do what's called scenario modeling. So you think about what are the most likely oil spills to happen 
in, in the Salish Sea. And the classic one is um, not making the turn at turn point, which is here, and um, a big crude carrier um, having a big spill. And so a spill like that might look like this. But then again, we could think about spills that have actually happened in the Salish Sea. And so here's a spill. This is uh, kind of like the Marathasa spill. So this is a small bunker sea spill um, from a ship at anchor. And I know Rachel and I are from the same lab, but we didn't actually collaborate on showing exactly the same two spills. Um, but these are two of the really classic spills to think about um, in, in, um, in the Salish Sea. But there's other spills. We could actually think about other accidents that have happened, like a fishing boat having trouble at the mouth of the Fraser River. Or we could think about a ferry having the same kind of disaster in Active Pass as happened um, for, for our theoretical crew carrier in, in, um, in uh, a turn point. And the question is, where do you stop? If we want to think about this, how many scenarios do we have to think about? And I think one of the important things to think about here is that these are not order of a magnitude difference in likelihood. They are all possible spills. And so I wanna move away from um, scenario modeling and adding more and more scenarios and think about a more statistical look, way to look at this. And so our question is, what are the spatial characteristics of a statistical distribution of oil spate fate in the Salish Sea? Okay, so that was my introduction and motivation. I'm gonna to talk to you about the model framework that we use for an individual spill. Then I'll talk to you about the Monte Carlo system, which gives us our statistical picture. I'll finish, uh, talk about the results and then finish with some conclusions. And on this slide, I quickly thank all our different funders. Okay, and so what we're using here is the MOHAD plus Salish CCAS modeling platform. And the core of this, of course, is the um, oil spill model. And we use the MOHID oil spill model. It is one of the few um, all bells and whistles spill models that's open source. So that HIBO can actually, and we can actually go in there and change things to make it work better. Um, there are very few um, open source oil spill models. Um, and so it includes the processes of spreading at the surface, it includes evaporation, it includes emulsification, it includes dispersion, which means um, oil that is pushed down below the surface by waves, it includes dissolution, and it includes biodegradation. biodegradation. It also includes um, um, beaching. And so that model is then driven by three sets of models. So it needs to know about the hydrodynamics of the system. It needs to know about the waves and it needs to know about the winds. The winds are coming from um, Environment Canada's HRDPS model. And those winds also force the waves model and the um, hydrodynamic model. The hydrodynamic model is Salish Seacast. And from that, the oil spill model is using the velocities, the salinity, the temperature, also the vertical diffusivities. And so we actually do track um, the push of the model, the mixing of the model fairly far down in, um, in tidal regions. And then that both of those are used to run the waves model from which we get the wave cap coverage and therefore um, the parameterization for dispersion of the oil spill model. Okay, then we have to decide what types of statistical runs we're gonna run. And so we have to look at where the ships are. And so our approximation, which is opposite of trying to select the most likely spills, we say if a ship is in the Salish Sea, it has a probability of spilling oil. So every ship everywhere, and this is what we call vessel time exposure. And that's what we use the AIS tracks for. And then, once we have uh, selected an EIS track, we need to know what kind of oil um, is probably carried by that ship. And that is a very uh, difficult problem to solve. And, and Rachel has spent a lot of time working on this. There is some very good data from the US Department of Ecology on oil transfer. And she used that um, and leveraged that to get the best answer we possibly could. And so then we generate 10,000 statistically based um, uh, spills and we run 10,000 spills. 
And so we need to know the time of the spill and we do that based on the vessel time exposure. We need to know the location, which we also select randomly based on the vessel time exposure. Once we've got that location and that time, we look in there, we select a particular AIS track. We look at that AIS track and we say, um, which vessel type was that? Um, would it likely spill cargo or is it only carrying fuel? Then we chose an oil type based on the route that that vessel is taking. We look at the vessel, we choose a length, and then we randomly choose the amount that is spilled. Okay, so now to talk about some results. And the first thing I wanna look at is some really just big bulk results. And that is where does the oil end up after seven days? And so we can look at that. Does it end up in the water column that is below the surface dispersed or dissolved? Does it end up on the water surface? Does it end up on the coast or is it in the air from evaporation? And we find that after seven days, most of the oil is on the coast, which at first seems surprising, but if you looked at Rich Pavlovich's drifter results from the Salish Sea, his drifters always end up on the coast. So perhaps it's not that surprising that this floating substance basically ends up on the coast. Um, one thing about this Mohid model is it does have beaching in it, but it doesn't have unbeaching, nor is the oil processed once it's on the beach. So there's no biodegradation of that oil or further evaporation of that oil. So this is oil that gets to the coast, but it's not allowed to leave. Okay, given that the vast majority of the oil ends up on the coast, the rest of the results I'm gonna show you are about the oil on the coast. Okay, so first of all, I ran 10,000 spills. And so this is the likelihood, if you had 10,000 spills, of where the oil would end up on the coast. Um, if you wanna think about a given spill, you should divide these numbers by 10,000, and that's the probability. So don't be too scared about this. Um, so here in the center, we have bunker C, and we can see that the vast majority of the high um, areas for beaching are around Victoria here, in the eastern end of Juan de Fuca. And that's mostly just because that's where the most ships carrying Bunker C are. If we look at diesel, on the other hand, we see a much more extended distribution um, because there are more ships to the north that are also um, using or carrying diesel. ANS is our representation of crude oil. There's a lot less ships carrying crude oil, so there's a lot less probability of a spill and therefore um, a less probability of that spill on the coast. And they are very much only in the southern part, and so that's why you're seeing the distribution like that. Okay, but given that there is oil on the coastline, what is the volume of that oil? So given that oil reaches a given point, say this point here, what is the most likely amount of oil? And so these are logarithmic scales here. And we can see if we look at diesel that we get the highest volumes of oil in constricted channels because if a ship has an oil spill there, more of it will go directly on the beach and the local beach. And so we see very high values here in the Fraser River and in other constricted um, locations. That's pretty much the same as the bunker with a slightly different shifted distribution. We can start to see Puget Sound lighting up here and also the north here, um, which is the channel out to the north, the inside channel to the point. But the really big um, oil volumes are due to crude. If a crude ship um, has a spill, it is carrying a lot of oil, it is um, it has low evaporation and it is highly likely to put a lot of oil on the coast. Okay, we can also look at another question in which is let's take some place in the Salish Sea and ask which spills cause oil to uh, at that coast and which don't. And so I chose a piece here of the Gulf Islands Marine Protected Area and this is the northern end of Sydney um, Island. 
very beautiful sandy beach spit as part of this marine protected area. Over here, I have marked all the spills that don't end up putting oil on that coastline. And on this side on the right, I show the ones that do. One thing is, of course, most of the spills don't, right? It's a small proportion of the spills that do, but there is a really big distribution of those because how the weather is at the time of the spill and the currents at the time of the spills really depend, change how the spills move. And so you can get, of course, um, oil from local spills, but also spills very far away. So you can't put a, a box around a marine protected area and say no ships through this area and that will protect a region. The spills come from a very long distance away. So Susan, two minutes? Okay. Sure. In summary, um, most oil goes to the coast. Um, crude oil is the least likely if you have a random spill but has the greatest impact volume. The likelihood of oil on a coastline for a given region varies by oil type. There are some um, coastlines that are particularly hard hit, like the north end of Orcas Island. And oil moves in a large moves a large distance in the Salish Sea, and relatively distant spills can impact a region. Thank you for your attention. And I see there's some chats. Um, and if there's some questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yes, there are questions from Zhao Yang ask you uh, how long going to take for these spill simulations. Okay, so each simulation takes about two hours on a one processor on um, a supercomputer. Great, we have time for another question. Anybody have a question for Susan? Okay, if not, uh, so the last speaker is myself. And uh, so, and I like share, uh, yeah. Okay, can you see my screen? Anybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, um, I revised my title and for the for the presentation. And so we start. I think more to be get more closer to the to this uh, theme of this uh, session. So I uh, revised title: How can a physical oceanographer contribute to study on marine oil spill? Because we have many presentations on oil spill. And uh, it's what I learned from Dr. Kenny's research network. Um, so uh, I, I announced Ken already officially retired from DFO, but uh, you know, I certainly can ever continue. So I know Ken for quite quite a few years now. And uh, so that's uh, Ken for the, I you know, watched him how to do Marie Oswald's research. So you know, certainly Ken go to the field and to do the to do the drop instrument and also the uh, you know on, on, on the coast. And in the lab, this is a lab from the Cougar and the BIO campus. Uh, this a uh, wave tank and the flume tank. I'm not sure which one. Uh, uh, Ken introduced in the beginning of the last five years, Ken is leading this uh, multi-partner research institute on marine oil spill. And uh, he has this map, have these all the uh, researchers support, supported by MPR around the globe. Uh, quite amazing work. So we are good. We are went these meetings or conference or workshops of marine oil spill, and uh, so I keep on learning that there's a the it's a related to my field or physical oceanography is a, is a behavior uh, behavior at the feet of spill oil and the influence of ocean waves, currents, mixing, temperature, salinity, density, and sea ice. So that's all this work familiar to me, but these can be linked to the oil. So the, for the oil spill research, uh, you know, I've seen people using this because uh, there's limitation environmental constraint, and so there are limited field experiments and field of observation. Of course, there's if there's a oil spill happening, thing that like a deep horizon uh, accident, there's a lot of observation uh, for sure. Then and uh, BL this uh, Cougar lab, and uh, I see you know people work on day and nights on this uh, lab experiment. And uh, to to study the oil and in the wave tank, and uh, the collaborator on MPR or Cougar, and they they use some very small scale numerical modeling, uh, like large eddy simulation and uh, other, uh, you know other very very 
uh, it's, uh, it's not, not like us work on large scale, but we are focused on small scale modeling. Uh, and of course, they're based on statistical or theoretical analysis to upscale their results. And uh, some are very like fundamental fluid mechanics. And uh, so there are some excellent scientists there who work on that part. And uh, this large scale modeling, like uh, the, the Mohid and or the Zhou Yang introduced the model. And uh, so they're using the ocean uh, and weather model inputs. And uh, these are the you know, contribution from physical oceanographer and meteorologists. So these are approach they use. And uh, this is an example, and uh, Zhi Chen and from Concordia, and he's developed this uh, deep water oil spill um, model. And uh, so, so the model have this part, you can separate the near field modeling part and far field modeling. So near field modeling, this DSD is a drop side, droplet side distribution model. And then this, uh, if it's underwater blow out, they have this called jet model and from the, from the pipe or from the, you know, from the, from the oil uh, uh, field and to, uh, uh, to uh, well, to, to get the best part. Of course, these are, these are near field model, but small scale. And they get a far field model and yes, adding the chemistry part, which is called a weathering model. And our oceanographers and uh, give this uh, field, these currents, wind, temperatures, well, another current here, and uh, temperature, I think it's in the not sure. Okay. And uh, so these are from us. And there's oil properties and uh, this release information. So that's uh, you know, that's 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 geography information, and uh, these are oil properties and fit in both the jet model and far field model. So that's where we see our con we can contribute. And uh, so this uh, from the recent uh, uh, submitted uh, uh, paper, and uh, they 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 do uh, this um, uh, uh, is a hypothetical blowout accident. I'm not sure how to turn on that. And uh, for the, a type of oil, a hibernian type of oil, and uh, leak for 10 days, and from this place in Newfoundland, off of, uh, in Newfoundland, about 800 meter water depths. And this simulation for, um, for 10 days, this result for two days, seven days, and 10 days, two days, seven days, and 10 days, uh, using two models, so, so red is one model and the blue is uh, this is, this is a, a DW OSM model. And so the, the two models, I would say their be you know their behavior quite similar, both on the from the uh, from the surface view and from this uh, you can see from the uh, rising from the eight hundred meter above the spread uh, surface. So model input they use six R winds. And uh, their daily ocean current from uh, temperature salinity from glorious uh, uh, ocean reanalysis re product. And they use, work, uh, use constant horizontal and vertical, vertical mixing. And both, uh, they're just a constant value uh, in, their, in the paper. So that comes to our thing about oceanography, right? So we are thinking about this region, and this is animation from the, with the, we did years ago with this car CRH 12 model, 12 by 12 degree resolution. And uh, this is a current at 90 meters. Uh, uh, so these are the current magnitude. And, uh, you know, so there's a lot of variability. There are certainly their current are, the Gulf Stream part are stronger and the lateral current are stronger. And, uh, but there's a lot of edits. I think even the study region somewhere here, you can see there's a, the current is, uh, is no either, you know, they're, they're stationary or constant. So if we do a 10 day simulation, the ocean state can be quite disturbed by the eddies from, from the mean state, mean state. So then there's a question, you know, how representative if when even you get a 10 days result from molecular ocean, from glorious, and how you are not quite statistical, statistically representative and for, for, the, for the scenario here. So you need a, probably need a many realization, many simulation to get a, a you know a representation for this area because it's hypothetical on scale. Or if before they run this oil spill model, can oceanographers derive such a kind of description and they add input for the oil spill model? I think that thing is the oceanographer task. So this is one part. 
And the other part is a mixing. And um, I, I think the mixing is, uh, is also where it's both uh, in space and time. Uh, this is a 136 degree model we did years ago and uh, uh, published earlier. And this is the surface eddy kinetic energy. And uh, for the surface geosorbital geo current, this is a 136 degree model, this is a 112 degree model, and this is from the uh, surface satellite uh, temperature data, a long time temperature data. So, you know, certainly they are similar, uh, but they're also the space, uh, space uh, variation. So where the high eddy kinetic energy, you will see they are more stronger horn delta mixing. And there certainly is not a uniform wind there. You choose a value, you will leave the uh, diffusivity to eddy kinetic energy. And so there is certainly, we expect stronger mixing here, lesser uh, weaker mixing here. And what about vertical? It's a vertical and I use a log scale in the, in the water, water depth, this is 100 meters, this is upper ocean. And two, you can see there is the upper ocean and deeper ocean, the mixing, this is, this is a mean flow, or this is a, the eddy kinetic energy, more can interpret like horizontal mixing. So, and uh, there's certainly there's a vertical variation for the, for the eddy energy. <clears throat> uh, of course, there's time variation, right? So this is the mean flow. These are two models can give a different solution. This is, one, this is a 112 degree and this is 136 degree resolution model. So this for the horizontal mixing or called the eddy, uh, uh, eddy mixing. And um, I guess that, you know, people usually forget horizontal mixing is in the ocean actually usually happen along the, the constant density surface or isopignal surface. Um, so there's a, if there's a wind mixing across uh, isopignols or Dixie surface, we call that pignol mixing, is caused by small scale three D turbulence, and this is significantly impacted by stress accretion. And uh, so it's all it's not a constant. So there's a mixed layer and the ocean interior, and uh, the mixing can be different. And um, Michel Bufido and uh, uh, published this paper, and he modified the the so what called the, the K profile vertical mixing in the upper ocean, and there's a support in the mixed layer, and uh, there's a chain, and so they have give a vertical vertical structure, and uh, it also relates to the wind speed, if different wind speed, uh, also the surface rough, roughness relate to the maybe surface waves, and there's a, is a you know this is more more clear, more realistic. The oceanographer believe this this one more than constant. So then Michel and uh, the team uh, use this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, calculated drop side distribution and uh, using the, uh, the red curve is a constant diffusivity is a mixed layer or the, the K profile, diff um, uh, K -K profile uh, diffusivity uh, in, the, uh, in the mixed layer. So the two meter wind and five meter wind. So five meter wind, the upper, upper layer gets getting, getting deeper and uh, two meter wind is shallower. And it's, it's a, there's difference. And this is six hours after the release and 24 hours after the release. And you can see the difference. I use a uniform uh, diffusivity. You get this curve, this, uh, this red uh, solid curve and uh, using uh, the, the K profile diffusivity, you get this, uh, this uh, scattered across. And so, and change the, in the time and also change with the wind condition. So, you know, there's a, there are methods, methods using different uh, uh, mixing. So I think that come to my summary slide. So what, what I learned from these OSPO uh, researchers, so the, they develop very sophisticated OSPO models. As we said, some are open source and mostly are not open source. And for both near and far field simulations, they develop on basic hyperdynamics. Uh, these are either single phase or multiple phase fluid mechanics, and very fancy. And also adding chemistry, called weather model, biology, microbiology, biology, and uh, uh, calibrate with the lab experiments and field observation. And these are models existing. So these models take ocean current waves, hydro hydrographic temperature salinity density, mixing, CIS as input, when I read their papers, I guess, you know, the, there's a complicated space time variation of this parameter, usually not uh, 
adequately considered. And there's certain sort of current. So to obtain a statistical rep representative description or prediction of a fetal behavioral uh, oil, an oceanographer should develop such de de description for ocean variation and uh, as input for the OSP model. And we should uh, further study the fine scale variations from both observational modeling, like the, uh, the ocean protection plan port models, and to do fronts and the intertidal zone and allocate this all matter for the oil spill. So the, my last slide, I also learned from Ken that already amazed by his uh, uh, cure, his uh, passion of science, uh, technology innovation, multidisciplinary research, and the spirit of collaboration. And I believe he'll continue in science after even his uh, official retirement. So these are, I think, can cover all this uh, in his slide presentation. Okay, how do I have this time? You're doing well, thank you. Um, and thank you, 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 for a great presentation. Just before we go to use question, I just want to say that um, we are going to try um, again to show Paul's um, presentation after the questions for you. you. Um, so Fred is going to try and put the slides up um, from his computer and hopefully that will all work. So we do have some questions in the chat for you. you, you. The first question is, um, from Xiaoyang. Um, may I ask if it's true that the hydrodynamic models typically do not have good performance on the edge of eddies, in particular in the, for the Japanese black current, um, the prediction was not good near, near the edge of that. Um, I'm not sure about the edge of the eddies. And uh, so, you know, our, our thing, most time our model starts to resolve eddies uh, and uh, permitting eddies start to resolve eddies. And if you're thinking about realistic, you know, there's starting when you increase resolution and we start some submetal processes. So with the most of, you know, the global model or, you know, regional model, we just starting to work on to, to, the, to the high resolution, you know, the fine steel structure. So in that sense, our model not, not still not perfect uh, or we're far from being perfect. And uh, so there's a, a room for, so when we increase resolution or you adding more, you know, you resolve more physics. And there are more other supplies going to happen. I'm not seeing any further questions. So, you do you want to um, take back over the chairing, and hopefully, we can have Fred show Paul's slides and have Paul give his presentation. Sure. Okay. I, I, before I get what Fred tried to show, I will thank every, all our commenters and uh, our co-chairs, and we all put this uh, this session and also our, all our presenters for today. So Fred, do you want to try and show those slides for us? <laughs> Great. Okay, uh, how okay, I'm very calm. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, um, I could have another go, Susan. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thumbs up now. Okay. Excellent. We can see those slides. Okay, very good. Very good. So, if you go to, so, all right, great, good. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving me another, another shot at this. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Go ahead, Paul. Okay, good. Good, excellent. Yeah, so I, as I was saying, I'm, I'm going to go through quickly these, these first ones since I've already said this. Um, so the Ocean Protection Plan permitted us to, to, uh, to do a two-year parallel phase. So, so basically, this was to um, um, respond to, to the need, um, um, you know, in, an, in a quasi-operational, in, in an operational uh, time frame, but not, not quite, you know, it, it, the output didn't go to the user. Uh, so this was to test Cosmos, but also, and maybe just as importantly, to test um, our responders and their ability to use uh, to use Cosmos because this was quite new to them. Okay, so next slide. Um, so I'm gonna go quickly there because that is basically the you know as Susan uh, and, and uh, uh, covered this. Um, so um, yeah, dispersion in the water column, um, ice. We got our we 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 do deal with ice and and beacon and spreading. 
of operations in multiple groups. Okay, next slide. Um, we could we could we could skip that. Um, um, yeah, let's skip that. Um, okay, so just a word on the actual models that we use. So uh, GOPS, the Global uh, ISO Two Prediction System, um, that's fully coupled. Also, these are NEMO models. Uh, the ICE is uh, CICE, um, and GOPS is coupled, uh, fully coupled with our atmospheric um, forecasting. It uh, drives the uh, the REOPS um, and and uh, which in turn um, runs uh, sea ops on the east and, uh, and the west coast. Great Lakes as well, so a couple of St. Lawrence um, is also a new, uh, is, is the 500 meter uh, model uh, from as well, so I should come online operationally close. Okay, um, so right, so here, um, if you click on the animation here, just to give an idea of a hypothetical um, oil spill, what it looks, what Cosmos looks like the, with, um, you should have a, okay. All right, so your animations aren't working here. Okay, well, that's annoying. Um, okay, we have a, we have a go at, yeah, so the animation here, no. So I'm, I'm just have a, a go at sharing my screen and see if that works. Have another play of this. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Hello? Oh, excellent. Very good. So let's I I'll um thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks, Fred. But I'm gonna, I'll take it from here. So here you can see how, so you can see the green uh, is uh, is uh, CEOPS and the red is uh, is REOPS. Uh, the gray is um, is wet tides, and you can see how you know a higher resolution model really gives a very different um, dispersion. Um, it gives a, a, you know the extent of this dispersion is is, is greater. You could actually even see some of the uh, the oil go below the surface and then reappear. Uh, um, you know, it's a, it's a 3D model. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, are you still with me We're on the next slide? Yep. Great. Yes. Oh, excellent. Very good. So, so far, so good. All right. So, these were the products that were um, that were disseminated during the uh, during the parallel phase. Um, they still look quite, quite a bit like this. On the right, you've got the, it's a, just the number of particles. Um, um, on the left, you've got um, what we've done is that we've actually put contours of concentration that, that, that correspond to the bond agreement um, on, on visible sheens. Okay, so uh, here you can you can just see this the very first um, um, uh, uh, sheen uh, type um, or the first two. Actually. And on the bottom right panel, you see the fake behavior. Um, of the, uh, the the processes as uh, you go through the um, uh, the thirty six hours. Okay, the green is the evap is, um, is evaporation. Um, so this was diesel. So of course it's going to evaporate quite quickly and do the, the mixing and the water for example. Okay. So the lessons learned from uh, um, uh, from this this parallel uh, phase is that if the Lagrangian dispersion models behave similarly. Uh, they are very much dependent on, um, on, 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 on the data given, the input data given, the differences with, with the current model used by ESTS um, for NEET is, is um, essentially with the big behavior, um, in particular the evaporation mixing, something we're looking into. Uh, many requests were for areas where, okay, so this is a really important point so that um, the, a lot of the areas where, for example, the uh, Bly Island that, 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 that lasted for six months, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the the recovery um, exercise lasted for for, for a long for, for quite a while. Uh, we actually weren't able to um, we, we didn't have the um, ocean data for for that area. So unfortunately, as, as Susan was mentioning um, earlier, uh, most spills happen in estuaries and, and and along the coast, and and that's you know we just don't have the resolution there. Um, uh, what we found was that a multidisciplinary approach is needed. Uh, ERS responders, as I was saying earlier, 
um, have a great experience in, in dispersion modeling, in particular for the atmosphere, um, but, but they don't have uh, the expertise needed for state behavior. And so we really need to work with the ESPS um, of science and technology and in, in emerging systems. Uh, the many, many requests require repeated simulations and, and um, over, over many, um, much longer than we, than we thought when we first thought. And, and, and the actual work with, with weather involved and, and the requirements for change. So Nick is not yet ready to use Cosmos um, in an operational um, uh, context, but um, drift, our drift modeling um, will most likely uh, go into operation first for the uh, OPP2 is funding a task force to develop a workflow between um, the SCS, the NEC, and, and ourselves to uh, to find a new uh, um, uh, workflow uh, and way to, to, to partner and, and, and have this multidisciplinary and to, to find the best use for uh, our customers. So the last two slides are just showing some recent work from uh, from Joe Shane, um on, on drift modeling. So this is a case uh, you might remember um, last year, um, the Zim Kingston um, met some very rough seas um, and yield uh, lost 109 uh, containers overboard. And uh, four of them were tracked from, uh, from day one here um, and, um, and found at the, the northern tip of uh, the island of Vancouver. And our five day, um, or Joe Shane's five day simulation using the drift. Uh, so the Lagrangian dispersion model, but without the behavior and, and using. So he, he showed this uh, yesterday morning um, in his talk um, where uh, quite a sophisticated uh, uh, leeway parameters are, are, are used um, for containers, uh, in, in this case, for containers. And, um, and the, the different tracks show um, one with, with waves um, and the other one with, without waves. And the one with waves um, gives a better, uh, uh, better result. Uh, because the another team um, actually um, uh, calculates slope drift um, from the from the um, last slide. Uh, this is another one. So this is very new um, that we can actually see the model um, at every time step with new um, uh, new filtering or new Lagrangian particles. Um, so at every 15 seconds, in this case giving a very realistic um, uh, result. And in fact, um, uh, oil was observed on, uh, along these, um, these, these coasts that are affected. Um, and um, some oil was observed in, in that first um, seen color from the bomb, uh, the bomb green. And, and if you don't know, the, the in this case, the uh, last report was under its own power. So, um, we, we need the trajectory, but if we don't, we can run the, uh, if it's coming from a, a, a ship or drift, we can uh, use the, 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 the drift uh, model to first um, determine its path and then um, see the model out along the path. Um, and then to my conclusions um, that I, uh, I, I mentioned. Uh, okay. thank so you thank you. Very much for giving me this extra time. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks. That's a technical challenge. I think. Uh, uh, thank you, Paul, and also thank everybody for staying late. And uh, I think the the award ceremony will start uh, soon. And uh, do we have any quick question for uh, for Paul or for any other speaker? Well, and uh, there's somebody post message on the chat. And uh, she is just a pretty impressive. Yeah. And uh, okay. Uh, I think, uh, you know, that uh, we're very late already. So I would, uh, you know, thank you everybody for, for and all our, as I said, our chair, our presenter, or our audience. And uh, I also thank Susan to help with a lot of the last minute. As also our technical person, uh, Dan Chung, and uh, for help. And uh, so everybody, and uh, have a good evening, and uh, I think it was the next uh, uh, award session. Okay. Okay. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you. You. Thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm.
，录完了，结束了，那我就停止录制啊，结束了。嗯。